Hello and namaste everyone. Welcome to this first episode of Space Talk series organized by SETS Nepal. My name is Abhishek Kafle and I'm your host for today. In this series, we plan to bring a bunch of guests from our share their experience on space related activities intended towards the development of space education in Nepal. In this show, we are targeting to bring space enthusiasts, students around the country and con connect them with the space industry individuals, students and professionals from around the world discussing topics related to space, including space law, engineering science, and scope of Nepalese students in space education. Today, we have with us a very special guest from Invine, California, Mr. Vesal Razavi Maliki. Vesal is a student working towards a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Physics from University of California, San Diego. He has experience in electronic hardware, experimental physics, and STEM education, and has been involved in a lot of space-related projects, including Student CubeSat project, and has worked at a rocket company. Vessel, welcome. Thank you so much, Abhishek. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Vessel, first of all, let me start by asking you why space, and what was your motivation towards joining space? Well, to be honest, Abhishek, uh, since I was a little kid, um, looking up at the stars was something that was pretty interesting to me. It was just a wonder to see the night sky, and it was I was filled with curiosity to uh, figure out what was out there, uh, what were those little dots, those little dots of light that littered the light sky, the night sky. And as I grew up, I saw all of the interesting and intricate fields that were involved in the space industry and how we as, um, as humans go about uh, exploring space. And I just wanted to be a part of that. So, so can you please explain me the projects that you have been worked on? Sure, of course. Uh, so I think my first, uh, big introduction to the space industry was during high school. And I was part of a large group of pretty fortunate students that um, got involved with the Irvine CubeSat STEM program. Uh, the Irvine CubeSat program was a joint program between uh, I think five, now six high schools uh, in the Irvine city. Um, and the goal was to develop a single one U CubeSat and send it to low Earth orbit. And uh, since then, uh, that of course uh, kind of skyrocketed my interest in avionics. And in university, I got involved with SEDS UCSD, uh, your UCSD sister organization. Um, and through SEDS, I've done a good number of projects, um, both in rocketry and kind of going into CubeSats again. Uh, we have a new project that's a CubeSat project that we're slowly developing right now. Um, and I've also, as of this summer, worked with Firefly Aerospace. Firefly is a new space company, um, kind of like following the footsteps of SpaceX, um, kind of like Rocket Lab and Virgin Galactic, um, something like that. And we're in Austin, Texas. And I've worked with the avionics team here as an intern, and it's been an amazing experience. Uh, regarding the uh, CubeSat project, what, uh, what suggestion would you like to give for someone who's just starting out in this uh, pocket, in these projects? Well, um, so CubeSats usually serve kind of specific purposes. Um, you don't wanna just throw something in orbit just to say you threw it in orbit, you want it to actually do something, right? So I think, at least my opinion is that coming up with a good mission is probably the first step towards setting up a project like that. Um, and of course, coming up with a mission idea isn't something easy, uh, but it just kind of takes, um, kind of a, a group brainstorming type of thing. So if you have a group of people who are all interested in pulling off a project like this, you just got to talk with them and see what you guys come up with as a group.
Uh, how did your team come up with this mission plan? Could you please uh, tell me something about that? The CubeSat program, right? Yes. <clears throat> well, uh, so the Irvine CubeSat program was actually set up by two parents who were interested, uh, who are from the technical fields and were interested in setting up a an extensive engineering program for students, something that was extracurricular outside of education. Um, and to be honest, uh, they actually came up with the first mission. But that mission actually got delayed due to um, hardware, hardware development delays, the initial mission they came up with. And I don't know whose initial idea it was, but the first CubeSat that uh, that the program launched, Irvine 01, was actually that the main payload, the mission was to test out a star tracking system um, that was for, uh, it was all software and it just employed a single camera. Um, and that was already going to be on the CubeSat, but it was kind of secondary um, to the main payload. But after the main payload got delayed, um, it just took conversation to see, well, what can we do? to mitigate that loss. And it was, well, we already have something pretty awesome. We can just throw it on there as our main payload now. So you've been involved in quite a few of these projects. So could you give us a secret about how could you, could you possibly finish these projects in the fastest way possible? I mean, how could we finish the, the development of CubeSat uh, quickly? Quickly. Well, yeah. you got to have good team organization. I, I, I don't know how I can tell you guys to do it quickly. It's just there's always going to be something that sets you back. Something's going to happen that you, you can't really expect. Um, and then all of a sudden, your schedule just goes to shambles. Uh, but it just like I've been saying, it's really a team effort. And if everyone can pitch in and give their own ideas, their own opinions about how to go about things. And then as a group, everyone can come up with a pretty set schedule. Even if that schedule breaks, if everyone is willing to keep working, then the team will figure something out in terms of how to keep going forward. There's not really a set recipe, I think. Uh, so talking in general, where do you think the small set industry is headed? Well, that's pretty general. Um, there, there are a lot of things you can do with, with small sats. Um, microsats and nanosats in particular are kind of the larger end of small sat, uh, small sats uh, systems and sizes. Uh, but those guys have potential to be a lot of different things. Like there are companies working on um, worldwide internet, uh, providing providing internet in the around the world in places that may not have it right now um, and they're using uh, microsats and nanosats uh, to do that kind of distribution um, and then there's also pico and femtosats and I don't know too much about the pico and femtosat um, systems but I do know that a lot of times they're part of um, pretty interesting projects that um, kind of connect with a larger satellite and perhaps they're like a swarm. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you could come up with for that. And um, it could be nowadays hobbyists are increasingly getting the chance to, to actually go to space. Um, and these hobbyists a lot of times have the coolest ideas. And um, I think that's going to become increasingly something that we'll see. Um, but yeah, as I've said, uh, micro and nanosats will have industrial applications as well, like internet, um, like science experiments, universities can send them up and uh, do atmospheric experiments or um, observe the stars with a smaller system. Uh, there's a lot of things that you could do. So coming back to the CubeSat questions, uh, I, I'm curious to know, where do you guys send your CubeSat for testing, for various testing? Mechanical as well as electrical. Um, yeah, so 
In the Irvine CubeSat program, uh, we split up into, we had five high schools. Later, we included a sixth high school, but at the time, it was five of us, or five high schools. Um, and each high school had a sub team. So each of the teams was responsible for its own hardware. Um, and we had set up kind of um, amateur test facilities in our high schools. That means um, anti-static. We had electrostatic discharge mats and um, gloves and wristbands and what have you for avionics hardware in particular for my high school was the avionics team. Um, and any sort of software testing was done on site. Uh, so we would have our hardware and upload whatever software would be um, pertinent to whatever type of testing we were doing. For example, like solar panel deployment was one that we did on site um, to actually see if the software works in conjunction with the hardware to deploy the solar panels on the CubeSat. Um, then there were larger uh, testing needs that had to happen like uh, radiation testing and um, thermal testing as well as uh, vibration. So those we went to larger facilities that we found that were local. Um, for example, radiation testing was done at the University of California, Irvine. Um, they actually have a nuclear reactor uh, on campus and we put our systems, our avionics hardware into a, um, a chamber and just blasted it with gamma rays uh, to see how the hardware would react while it was on and operating the like, software. Uh, talking about the softwares, uh, do you guys use open source softwares? Do you refer uh, other people to use uh, open source softwares or do you need to go for the high end uh, expensive softwares? So that's software. actually, right. That's a, that's a pretty good question actually. Um, so for Irvine 01, uh, we, uh, we were working in conjunction with Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and a lot of the uh, firmware and software architecture that we got that we used, uh, we actually got from them. So uh, part of it was just standard Linux and um, more of it was kind of custom made by Cal Poly. Uh, but since then I do, I have developed kind of an opinion that uh, open source software is pretty moldable to be used for space applications. Um, just because there exist these expensive um, and in-depth uh, pieces of software and hardware, um, it's not necessary that you have to use these things because as students or um, people who aren't necessarily directly involved with um, the space industry or a company that can easily afford these things, um, you, you don't have ready access like that. So, um, if you don't have ready access, you gotta improvise and open source software, commercial off the shelf hardware um, is a pretty good way to go. It's just a matter of making sure uh, cosmic rays, space radiation won't uh, negatively impact uh, your systems. And that's something that um, is just part of any mission development, regardless of what kind of hardware and software you're using. So. Um, you just got to keep that in mind. Uh, so talking about Irvine 01, Irvine 01 featured, uh, uh, featured in uh, electric spray thruster developed by Acuon Systems. Did you guys buy it or Acuon Systems sponsored it for you? Actually, Axion Systems was, a, um, was one of the big sponsors of the Irvine CubeSat program. So they actually, they gave it to us. They sponsored it for us. Um, yeah. Luckily, as students, we didn't have to worry about the financial side of the program. A lot of that was handled by the admin of the, of the program, particularly the two founders who did a lot of the outreach for us um, to get other people involved in helping us out. Uh, so, so we are, as in Nepal as well, we are developing pocket cube satellites. And we are looking for sponsors as well. So is there by any means 
uh, these guys could sponsor or, or be uh, partners for us in the future? Um, so Axion, uh, I think they're, they're pretty good people. Um, I, to be honest, I haven't worked uh, directly with them. I just know that the program's um, administration worked with them and they, um, they sponsored us. They gave us hardware to work with. Um, but I'd say they're pretty, um, they're a pretty interesting company and um, alternative propulsion is what they're all about. So um, it's, it's an interesting route to pursue. Um, regarding, regarding sponsors in general, I think that um, actually a lot of companies are interested in getting their hands um, into student projects and um, getting students to do uh, greater things, really. So if you just reach out to them um, and ask them, tell them what you guys are trying to do, um, what, what you want to achieve, and a lot of times they'll be more than willing to pitch in and help out. Uh, uh, this is our question. Uh, uh, in, in your point of view, how essential is a clean room for satellite assembly in the context of Earth orbiting nano pico satellites? What are the alternatives that you could suggest for us? Um, so, I think I kind of mentioned this earlier about like uh, testing, um, but regarding electronics, at, at least avionics hardware, um, what is very much necessary is anti -stat an anti-static environment. Um, so you need like ESD, electrostatic discharge mats that are grounded um, to make sure that static electricity doesn't damage any of your hardware. Um, because a lot of flight hardware, flight electronics are very sensitive. So um, just a little static shock can actually pack up an enormous punch into your systems and permanently damage some stuff. So that's that that piece of um, environmental uh, status, like uh, anti-static, um, is very important. But there are, it's kind of a loose interpretation regarding clean rooms for nanosats. Um, it's not as important as it might seem um, to be very strict. Um, you just need to make sure that you don't get like obvious sources of um, contamination into your systems when you're integrating. So for like flat board testing and stuff, it's just, you know, keep food and water away, stuff like that. Um, make sure you're properly covered yourself so you don't like shed hair or sweat or anything um, into your systems. Don't want that to happen. Um, but having an extremely large scale uh, clean room is not necessarily important, at least during the testing and development stages. So overall, for a small and developing country like ours, we do not have uh, much access to space education, and we do not have much equipment or infrastructure as such at the present. So to, uh, to grow up uh, to space education from here, and what suggestion do you like to give to us? Um, well, just stay interested. Uh, even though there's not an infrastructure set up to uh, to provide space education, as you put it. Um, there's still uh, the, cur the personal curiosity um, that will drive everyone. And you just gotta stay interested. And if you're really interested enough, then um, start contacting people that you think can help you. Um, if there's not something in place already, then um, you gotta try and make something uh, and you really start by contacting people and, and expressing your interest. So now I'd like to uh, place this field open to all the participants. If there is any question, you could go ahead and ask special.
So I'll read out the question from the participant. So this is one question from Nitesh Kumar. So for the development of satellite in Nepal, we're conducting the cancer competition in Nepal. So is there any support for cancer competition or is there any means that you, you can help them to connect uh, with the sponsors or kind of supporters? Uh, CanSat, you said, right? Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not too familiar with um, CanSat architecture and how they work. Um, I think uh, just a bit of searching online can probably do you uh, some help. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm not too familiar with the very specific uh, specifics of CanSats and whether or not certain companies are interested in sponsoring. Um, but but yeah, I think I think if you guys start reaching out to maybe look for people who are have a similar mission to maybe what you're trying to do with uh, with whatever CanSat system that you guys are setting up, whatever your mission is, your goal is, um, and find someone who's doing similar things and reach out to them. I think that's probably the, the easiest way to start out. Thank you, we're waiting for a question from viewers. For sure. So in the meantime, you can explain about your future plans if you would like to explain. Yeah, definitely. Um, so right now, uh, SEDS UCSD um, that I've been involved with since I started university, um, we, we have a bunch of projects that are ongoing, um, like static, uh, we have a static test fire stand uh, for testing rocket engines, and that's kind of an ongoing um, interest of the organization to um, not only test our own engines but test other people's engines for them um, and that's kind of a, a source of outreach for us and networking um, which I'll increasingly be involved with uh, in the coming year um, and also I briefly mentioned before that we just started a CubeSat project at SEDS UCSD and that project um, is still in its early stages, um, but I'm hoping that we can get uh, something finished and at least at least ready for a launch um, before I uh, leave university or at least undergraduate. Um, but we have a, a good team, a dedicated team that's developing this project, and that'll be interesting to see. It's a uh, um, we're hoping to look at RF frequencies um, that are being emitted from the Earth uh, with just a 1U or 2U uh, CubeSat architecture. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how we go about doing that. Um, for me personally, uh, I am going into my third year of university. So I have two years left. Um, so, you know, just a lot of studying and projects and all that. So, um, it's kind of just in that stage of working so I can get somewhere I'd like to be. You know? And I think hard work is, is an important part of, of achieving your goals. So, just to anyone who's watching, um, if you're interested in something, you just gotta keep working at it and stay interested. Don't get discouraged when a small thing goes wrong um, or something unexpected happens. Um, as uh, Abhishek mentioned, I study engineering physics. Um, so a lot of what I do in terms of my classes is both a mix of um, electronics and electrical engineering, uh, at least on the hardware side and also the fundamental physics that's behind that. Um, and I think that's an interesting mix of stuff, um, particularly regarding 
um, new semiconductor devices that are coming out these days. Um, so it's, it's like an up and coming research heavy field. Um, but then, you know, on the side, there's also space industry and all of my extracurriculars really thus far have been space related. So I want to find out if there's a way I can mesh these things together. So that's kind of my goal in the next few years. Okay, thank, thank you. So we, we have one more question from Sora, Sora Sagar Pradhan. So the question is, what are your thoughts on how CubeSat swarming technologies related to high-speed internet connectivity is, is going on as of now? So what do you think are the major challenges as of now for these networks? And what do you think are the more areas where CubeSat swarm can really help in science, space science and astronomy? So I repeat, so what are your thoughts on how CubeSat swarming technologies related to high-speed internet connectivity is going on as of now? What do you think are the major challenges as of now for these networks? And what do you think are more areas where CubeSat swarms can really help in space science and astronomy? The question is by Sourat Sagar Pradhan, president of Southwestern State College Astronomy and Astrophysics Club. OK. Um, so I do know that right now there are companies that work on providing internet um, via microsats and nanosats. Uh, one of them is uh, actually Astronis. Um, they're based in San Francisco. Um, so this is actually a goal that's, I think, been going on for the past maybe five years or so um, to set up satellite internet architecture using more state-of-the-art and um, modern uh, satellite systems that are you know, smaller, microsats, nanosats. Um, I think that uh, that's going to be really important in the next few years um, because it's sad to say that a lot of places still don't have ready access to um, to the internet, uh, and the internet is uh, has its ups and downs. But uh, a lot of it is just um, sharing information, and if someone doesn't have access to the information that a lot of other people do, then um, they're at a loss and that's sad. Um, so the mission to set up internet architecture using satellites is incredibly important um, and I'm all for it. Um, I think maybe more uh, companies will jump on board with this idea uh, as well in the next few years as it becomes more lucrative. Um, regarding astronomy and uh, space sciences, uh, and applications in general of CubeSats and small sats. Um, really, it's up to whoever is wanting to do the research to figure out uh, how they can use small sats. Um, if someone has a certain research goal and they see that they can uh, accomplish it with a small sat, then um, that's their idea, and it's it's. Um, it's up to them how they go about doing it. Um, I know of uh, research groups who do atmospheric research with CubeSats. Uh, they point their CubeSats uh, downward towards the Earth and they, uh, they look at Earth's atmosphere. Um, I don't know too many specifics about what their research is, but I do know that that's a growing field among uh, university groups. Um, and of course, the other way around, you can point your sensors and cameras uh, outward. Uh, so uh, right now, like the way we image uh, space is through larger telescope systems. Um, but perhaps uh, this type of stuff will become, like space observation will become more open to amateur groups and student groups uh, with uh, these smaller satellite systems, microsats and cubesats. So a quick uh, confusing question. So I like a uh, confusing question. What is the future of space industry and which country is leading in this industry in your point of view? It's quite a con confusing question. What is the, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Future of space industry. Okay. And which country is leading in, in this industry in your view? That is a hard question. Um, <laughs> so right now I think uh, one of the biggest things uh, in the space industry is opening up 
um, space to more people, uh, more groups. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I'm sure you guys have heard the term new space or the new space movement. Um, and that's all about making space more accessible. Um, private companies are setting up launch services that, um, that are open to everyone. Before, you kind of just had to go through government, uh, government provided services uh, to make it to orbit. But now, um, a lot of companies, you know, started with SpaceX really, and then Rocket Lab and Virgin Galactic and Firefly that I work at uh, right now, and a lot more um, are trying to get more people to be able to get to space. Um, so that includes, you know, university groups, student groups, uh, smaller companies. Um, there's also the push to get to the moon and to Mars now. Um, yeah. And that's exciting for a lot of people. Um, so that's also something that these new space companies are also um, involved in. They want to get to orbit so that they can get to the moon and so that they can get to Mars. Um, so that's, that, that's exciting. And really, I can't wait in the next decade and so, or so um, to see where that leads. Um, and I hope I can be a part of it. And I encourage everyone who's interested to make themselves a part of it as well, because it's going to be awesome. Um, there was a second part to that question, wasn't there? Yeah, uh, the question was, uh, which country is leading in this industry? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe no country, because uh, increasingly it's becoming private. So, private. yeah, so perhaps it's, it's more of a private endeavor now. It doesn't matter what country you're from or where your headquarters are. I think it's Elon Musk more than the company this is. Yeah, yeah. SpaceX, of course, the original. <laughs> okay, so I have one more question from Sora Sagar Prasan. The question is, does the ablative control pulse plasma thresher have a future? What should be focused for its improvement or development? I repeat, does the ablative control pulse plasma thruster have a future? What should be focused for its development or improvement? You know, I'm, I'm curious to learn more about that system. Um, I, I think that uh, with more testing, um, it may have a future, um, but I'm not too knowledgeable about it to be able to offer a, um, a distinct answer. Um, I think I'm a pretty big fan of alternative propulsion systems in general. Uh, so I'm all for it if it's efficient and it works. Um, that's pretty much all I can say. Sorry, I can't give more. <laughs> okay, no problem. So can you, uh, is it possible for you to explain about your role in uh, Firefly Space? Yeah, sure. I can give an overview. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm an avionics intern. Um, so I help out with um, a bunch of different sub teams uh, in the avionics uh, team at Firefly. Um, so I've worked on new lab and test equipment that needed developing, like they needed to uh, emulate certain uh, certain pieces of, of like flight trajectory, like stage separation and stuff like that um, in in their labs and their simulations. Um, and I've worked on hardware development for that. Um, and I've worked on other test equipment uh, for like post integration, um, sensor polarity checking and uh, stuff like that. Uh, done some minuscule scripting for, uh, to be used in hardware in the loop uh, simulations. Um, and also I've worked on ground hardware uh, for, you know, kind of the intermediary between uh, ground station electronics and um, the actual flight vehicle. Uh, so that's actually kind of what I'm, the last thing I'm working on before I head out and back to school um, is like the, the actual intermediary between uh, the rocket the umbilical comes down, it has to connect to the ground systems, right? So uh, the actual, the, how do I say it best, I guess? Um, 
the conversion systems to connect it to the ground and data acquisition, et cetera. Uh, I'm not you. sure if you have heard about this, but uh, Chandrayaan 2, India's uh, uh, attempt to land in the moon failed yesterday 2.1 kilometers uh, before uh, landing in the moon. So any thoughts of yours in this? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, we, we had it open um, at Firefly yesterday. We were watching it. Um, uh, this was, if I'm not mistaken, the second attempt, yeah. right? Uh, That's so, yeah. So I think um, I think that how far uh, Chandrayaan got was uh, was pretty good. Um, it's it's exciting to see that they made it that far to the moon. Um, and even though it, it uh, if I'm not mistaken, at least from what I saw that the feed I was watching, um, they made it to about two kilometers and then the feed just cut out. So they they're not sure. Two point one kilometers. Two point one kilometers. Yeah. So their feed just cut and they're not exactly sure what happened. I don't know since yesterday um, if there have been any more updates, but I think yeah. that um, if I'm not mistaken, it's possible that Chandrayaan is just sitting on the surface of the moon yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Can, yeah. So um, I think that um, a third attempt will probably be successful considering that um, the mission made it this far on the second attempt. This will be interesting to see. So anything uh, you would like to say to students from Nepal? Yeah, of course. Uh, it's, first of all, it's, it's, been, it's been a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I really love it when I see that there are people interested in space um, and because it's the future. Uh, we expanded all over Earth, and now uh, we're going to go to go to space. And so, to see people excited about space and excited about the future um, is exciting for me. So it's it's just stay interested. I think I've said that like three times over the time I've been online. Um, yeah. So stay curious, stay interested, uh, and keep working hard. So at last, how was your experience with the space talk? First space talk of Safe Nepal. Well, it's awesome. I'm glad you guys are doing this. Um, you guys are providing um, a source of information. However limited my knowledge is, um, I can share what I do know um, and also my opinions. Um, and I think I think your guys uh, your guys' program will grow because it's you'll have even more interesting people than me on the program afterward and um, it'll be awesome. So at last, thank you, Vesel, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Likewise, and, thank you. And I hope in future uh, we'll get connected not only through these uh, talks, but also through actual projects that we are involved in and you are involved in. And you could uh, share much more technical and more uh, project related knowledge in the future. Thank you. That that would be awesome. I would look forward to something like that. Thanks for having me. So Pradita, at the end, could you say anything? So he's been our uh, uh, mentor to start this event and has helped us connect uh, us together. So Pradita, I think you guys did a great job hosting this event. So uh, congratulations. And Vesol, thank you very much for uh, joining us. and. Uh, spending time with us and my pleasure from the students from the uh, and uh, to all the audience uh, thank you for uh, joining and uh, listening to our first space talk event I hope you guys enjoyed it thank you very much thank you thank you so any viewers who, who missed the question can ask the question in the comment. We can just uh, pass the question to Vishal later and we can reply to you as well. Sounds good to me.